Let's begin our discussion with heat transfer. There's three ways in which an object could transfer heat energy. That is conduction, convection, and radiation. Now let's say if we have an object that is at a relatively high temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. And let's say the temperature of the environment is 25 degrees Celsius. If you touch the object with, let's say, a metal rod, heat will flow from the object directly to the metal. Whenever heat transfer occurs by contact, it's conduction. Now the object can also transfer heat by convection. Air can carry away heat energy from the hot object. So whenever heat energy is transferred by the movement of a fluid, be it a liquid or a gas, that's convection. A good example of convection is, let's say if you have a hot surface. This is going to heat up the air above it. So hot air will rise. Whenever you heat up an object, it expands. And density is mass over volume. So when the air is heated, it expands the volume decreases and so I mean the volume increases, I take that back, as it expands and the density decreases. Whenever you have a, a light object, light objects tend to float. For example, if you put an object that's less dense in water, it's going to float. An object that's more dense in water will sink. So hot air, because it's light, it rises up to the top. Cold air will sink. And so you have this heat transfer going on. And this is an example of convection, where heat is being transferred by the movement of a fluid. Now the last example is radiation. So this hot object can radiate heat in all directions. Typically, heat is transferred by infrared radiation, and there's no contact at all. So think of the sun. The sun emits infrared rays and visible light waves as well, but that radiation comes through us without the need of anything in between, because space is empty. So that's the third form of energy transfer, it's radiation. There's no contact for this type of heat transfer. So make sure you know the difference between conduction, which requires contact, convection, which deals with the movement of a fluid, like a liquid or a gas, or radiation, which doesn't require any medium to transfer heat energy. Now there's an equation that can help you to calculate the rate of heat flow whenever two objects are in contact with each other. So let's say if you have something that looks like this. On the left side, let's say the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. And on the right side, it's only 20 degrees Celsius. You know heat is going to flow from hot to cold. You can think of heat as being associated with the energy of the molecules. The higher the temperature of an object, the more kinetic energy the molecules have. They're vibrating more, they're colliding more. And so these molecular collisions will eventually transfer their energy from one place to another. So heat will naturally flow from hot to cold. Now there's an equation that helps you to relate the amount of heat that's going to flow in any given time period. So you need to know that the rate of heat flow is proportional to the area, the cross-sectional area, of the conductor. It also is dependent on the temperature difference. If these two temperatures are the same, there's going to be no heat flow. The greater the temperature difference, the greater the amount of heat flow that will occur. 
So the rate of heat flow depends on the change in temperature and also the length between the hot and the cold section. So if you increase that distance, that should decrease the rate of the heat flow. Here's the equation that you need to know. Q, which represents the amount of heat energy, the change in Q divided by T, so that's the rate of heat energy being transferred, that's equal to K, which is the thermal conductivity of the substance, or the material that you're using, times the cross-sectional area, times the difference in temperature, divided by L. So now let's think about what this means. By the way, what equation or what variable relates energy divided by time? You need to know that power is equal to energy over time. Energy has units joules. Time is in seconds. So you need to know that one watt, which is the unit of power, that's equal to one joule per second. If we increase the value of K, which is the thermal conductivity, the rate of heat flow will increase. So this, which is equal to P, that's going to increase. Now, the rate of heat flow is also proportional to the cross-sectional area. If you increase A, the power or the rate of heat flow will increase as well. Basically, anything in the numerator is going to be proportional to the quantity on the left side, in this case the power. So if we increase the change in temperature, the rate of heat flow will increase as well. But notice that it's inversely related to L. If you increase L, the energy transferred per second will decrease. Let's try this problem. So we have a glass window. Let's see if I can draw a nice glass window. And the glass window is 1.4 centimeters thick. It has a, a length of 2 meters and a width of 3 meters. And let's say the inside temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and the outside temperature is 22. So we know heat is going to flow from the inside to the outside from hot to cold. Now what we want to know is what is the rate of heat flow through a glass window? Now we're given the thermal conductivity of a typical glass window. So how can we find the rate of heat flow? Now let's calculate delta Q over T. That represents the rate of heat flow which is basically the power in units of watts. So using the equation, we know it's K times A times the change in temperature divided by L. So let's get rid of this. So K, which is the thermal conductivity, that's 0.84 joules per second per meter per Celsius. Now the area is 2 by 3, so it's 2 meters by 3 meters, which is 6 square meters. And the change in temperature, if you're not sure whether the temperature should be in Celsius or Kelvin, you can go with Kelvin. But anytime you have a change in temperature, Celsius can work. So the change in temperature is 3 degrees Celsius, 25 minus 22, divided by the length. L is basically the thickness of the glass. However, we do need to convert it to meters. One point, 100 centimeters is basically 1 meter. So you need to divide 1.4 centimeters by 100, which is 0 0.014 meters. So notice the units. Celsius will cancel. 
and square meters will cancel with these two. So we're left with the unit joules per second, which is basically watts. So it's going to be 0.84 times 6 times 3 divided by 0 0.014. So the answer is 1080 watts. So basically, every second, 1080 joules of heat energy is being transferred through this uh, glass window. Let's try this problem. If 1080 joules of heat energy is transferred through the window every second, how much energy will be transferred in a month? So we know that power is equal to energy divided by time. So the energy is the power multiplied by the time. The time is one month, but we need to convert it into seconds. On average, there's 30 days per month. And it's 24 hours in a day. And there's about 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. So there's 3,600 seconds in a single hour. So if we multiply 30 times 24 times 3,600, you should get a time value of 2,592,000 seconds in a single month. So now let's calculate the energy. So we have 1,080 joules of energy being transferred every second. So if we multiply by this many seconds, we should get the total energy transferred in a single month. So the final answer is about 2.799 times 10 to the ninth power. So that's how many joules is being transferred through this window in a single month. Now let's move on to another topic. Sometimes you might have to deal with R values. The R value basically describes the thermal resistance of an insulator. It's equal to L divided by K, where L is the thickness of the material, which is the distance between the hot and cold section of the material. So notice that K and R are inversely related. Whenever K goes up, R goes down. And R and L are directly related. If L goes up, R goes up. So whenever you increase the thickness of a material, you increase its insulation, its thermal resistance. If you increase the conductivity, well, the insulation decreases. So K and R are inversely related. So for example, let's consider a metal such as silver. Metals are excellent conductors of heat. And so for silver, the thermal conductivity is very high. It's 420 joules per second per meter per Celsius. In the case of glass, glass has a, a thermal conductivity of 0.84. Fiberglass has a thermal conductivity value of 0 0.048. Now we can see why. Silver, which is a metal, is an excellent conductor of heat. Metals conduct heat very well due to the free flowing electrons that are found in metals. So it has the highest K value. Therefore, silver should have a very low R value. Now, glass is an insulator. It doesn't really conduct heat very well. But fiberglass is a better insulator because it has a lower K value, which means fiberglass has a relatively high R value. 
So just keep this in mind. K describes the thermal conductivity of a material. So if it has a high K value, it's a heat conductor. If it has a low K value, it's an insulator. The R value describes uh, insulation. A substance with a low R value is a good heat conductor, and a substance with a high R value is a good insulator. Now let's work on this problem. The R value for a certain building material that is 2.4 millimeters thick is 1.5. What is the R value if the thickness is increased to 4.8 millimeters? Well, we know that R is directly related to L, but inversely related to K. So if we increase L, R is going to increase. Now, let's say if we double the value of L, because it increased from 2.4 to 4.8, and increased by a factor of 2. What should happen to the R value? Because R is proportional to L to the first power, the R value should double as well. So it should equal 3.0. Now we can come up with an equation that relates R and L. Let's write the ratio between R2 and R1. R2 is going to be L2 divided by K, and R1 is L1 divided by K. For the same substance, K is the same, so we don't need to write a subscript for it, which means we can cancel K. And then we're going to get this equation. R2 divided by R1 is equal to L2 divided by L1. So R1 is 1.5. We're looking for R2. L1 is 2.4 millimeters. L2 is 4.8. So if we cross multiply, this is going to be 2.4 times R2. And that's equal to 1.5 times 4.8, which is uh, 7.2. And to find R2, we need to divide both sides by 2.4. 7.2 divided by 2.4 is 3. So now we can answer the second part of the problem. Let's use the same equation. So if we decrease the thickness, the R value should be less than 1.5. So R1 is still 1.5. We're looking for R2 again. L1 is 2.4, but L2 is 1.7. So let's cross multiply. 1.5 times 1.7 is about 2.55 and that's equal to 2.4 R2 so now 2.55 divided by 2.4 will give us an R2 value of 1.06 so as you can see it's less than 1.5 now the next thing that we need to quantify is the amount of heat energy that flows by means of radiation. So let's say if we have an object. Every object emits thermal radiation. As you increase the temperature of the object, the more thermal radiation it's going to emit. And the equation that you need is called the Stefan Boltzmann equation. The rate of heat flow is equal to the emissive the emissivity, there we go, almost pronounced that wrong, times the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the area of the object times the temperature raised to the fourth power. So this is how much energy that is being emitted by this particular object. The emissivity factor varies between 0 to 1. An object with an emissivity of 1 is an object that is a good absorber of heat and also it can emit heat very efficiently. If the emissivity factor is close to 0, that means that it really is not good in emitting heat energy. Now, this particular value is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power. So that's the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And A is the area in square meters. And temperature 
Notice that we don't have a change in temperature. The temperature has to be in Kelvin, not Celsius, for this to work. In this problem, we have a sphere with a radius of 25 centimeters, which is 0.25 meters. And this sphere is at a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the surroundings is positive 2 degrees Celsius. So heat is going to flow out of the sphere into the surroundings. However, this heat flow is the net heat flow. In this problem, you need to understand that heat not only leaves the sphere, but also enters the sphere. However, the amount of heat that's emitted by the sphere is greater than the amount of heat that is absorbed by the sphere from the surroundings, so that there's a net heat flow of heat leaving the sphere. So generally speaking, heat will flow from hot to cold. Even though it goes both ways, the net heat flow is from hot to cold. Now let's work on part A. So let's move this somewhere else. So what is the rate of heat energy leaving the sphere? So let's use the equation delta Q divided by delta T is equal to E theta times A times the change or just times T raised to the fourth power. So the emissivity factor in this problem is 0.42. The constant is always going to be the same and that is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. Now what about the area of a sphere? The area is equal to 4 pi times r squared. So 0.25 squared, make sure r is in meters, times 4 pi is about 0.785. Now we need to multiply it by the temperature of the sphere, which is 27 degrees Celsius, but we need to convert it to Kelvin. To find the temperature in Kelvin, add the Celsius temperature plus 273. So this is going to be 300 Kelvin raised to the fourth power. 300 raised to the fourth power is a big number. It's about 8.1 billion. If we multiply that by 0.785 and 0.42, any other number, you should get a value of 151.4 watts. So every second, the sphere is emitting 151.4 joules of energy. So that's how much energy it's emitting by radiation. Now how much energy is going into it by radiation? We need to use the same equation. By the way, let's put a negative sign since this is how much energy it's losing every second. Now part B, to find the energy that's entering into the sphere, we need to use the temperature of the surroundings. So everything is going to be the same, the 0.35, the constant, and the area is going to stay the same. The only difference is the Kelvin temperature. So we need to add 273 to 2 degrees Celsius to get a Kelvin temperature of 275 raised to the fourth power. So if we multiply everything, I do need to fix something. I don't know why I have 0.35. That should be a 0.42. So this is equal to 106.9 watts. So that's the answer to part B. So in part A, the amount of energy that the sphere is losing 
is 151.4 watts. Part B, the amount of energy that the sphere gains per second is positive 106.9 watts, which means that there's a net loss if we combine these two. of 44.5 watts. So what this means is that every second the sphere loses 44.5 joules of energy. Every second. And we can see why it's losing energy. The temperature of the sphere is greater than the temperature of the surroundings. So that means that the sphere emits more radiant energy than the amount of energy it absorbs from the environment. But when the temperature of the environment is greater than the temperature of the sphere, the environment will emit more radiation into the sphere than the amount that the sphere will radiate into the environment. So whichever object has the higher temperature, it's going to emit a greater amount of heat than the amount of heat that is absorbed by the surroundings. So with these problems, you have to think of the like how much energy is going in, how much is going out, and what's the net flow of heat energy? So this is the answer for part C. Now what about part D? So we know the change in power is 44.5 watts. How long will it take for the sphere to lose 1 million joules of energy? So remember, 1 watt is 1 joule per second. So the sphere it loses 44.5 joules per second. We know that power is equal to energy divided by time, and energy is power multiplied by time. In this problem, we're looking for the time. The time is the energy divided by the power. So let's start with the energy, which is 1 times 10 to the 6 joules. And we're going to divide it by the power, which is 44.5 joules per second. Notice that the unit joules cancel. So we simply have to divide these two numbers. 1 times 10 to the 6 divided by 44.5 is about 22,472 seconds. Now how many hours is that? Because that's a long time in seconds. Whenever you have a time value that's very high in seconds, convert it to a more practical unit. So let's convert it to hours. We know that there's 3,600 seconds in a single hour. So this is about 6.2 hours. So that's how long it's going to take for the sphere to lose 1 million joules of energy, assuming, of course, if the rate of heat flow is constant. That is, if the temperature of the sphere and the temperature of the surroundings, if it stays at that level. Now, we know in reality the temperature of the sphere is going to decrease. And as that happens, the rate of, the, the rate of heat flow will decrease as well because it's dependent on temperature. So as the temperature decreases, the rate of heat flow will decrease as well, so it's not really constant. But we're going to assume as if it's constant. If it is, it's about 6.2 hours. But in reality, since the temperature is decreasing over time, the rate of heat energy that's leaving the sphere will decrease. And so it's going to take longer for the sphere to lose a million joules of energy. So it's really longer or greater than 6.2 hours. But we're going to keep this problem simple. We're going to assume that the rate of heat flow stays constant.